Well, you notice if you look at those two stamps, the B21 and the B22, they both have a plus four and a plus five. And that in semi-postals is a revenue maker for whatever organization or person or group it's for. In the left stamp, the green stamp, Rizal is playing chess. In the right hand blue stamp, he's sword fighting or dueling. That's an amazing combination. Now, you need a little history of the Philippines. And so the next couple slides will show you some of the history of the Philippines. Magellan was commanded to set off to on an expedition in 1519, that's amazing, to become the first to circumnavigate the globe. In 1521, he discovered the 7,600 island archipelago as Spanish explorers approached from Asia, while the Portuguese came from the Indian Ocean. Now, it was the age of exploration, the age of conquering places, getting them for England, for Spain, for Portugal, for the Dutch. In 1543, the Spanish named the islands that they found after King Philip. So that's why they had the name Philippine, King Philip II. And there they established their first settlement in 1865. Magellan's voyage in 1519 demonstrated to the world that the world was round. That was pretty amazing back then. It's kind of hard to think of it as being flat from our perspective in 2022, but that's the way they thought in those days. And then he could go around the world encircled by contiguous oceans. And that allowed the colonization of lots of the isles in the new world. Can you imagine getting in a ship like that with 50 other guys and then going off to some place you knew not where you were going? That's amazing to me. But there's lots of great pictures on stamps of sailing ships. And this set of Philippine stamps of five pesos indicate a, a couple people. Magellan was a Portuguese explorer, but he was hired by the King of Spain. He departed from Spain in 1519, and he was in the admiral of the Spanish fleet. The set of stamps over there cost maybe about two bucks, but they're pretty. They're really a nice set. Pictured at the top of that set is Antonio Pigafetti. I don't know if that's pronounced right or not. He was an Italian scholar and explorer, and there were 18 men who made the complete trip returning to Spain in 1522. Started in 1519 and then ended up returning home in 1522. I just wonder how, you, when you're out in a ship in an ocean with water all around, how you find where you're going. I know they had the tools to do it. The second stamp in that series is Magellan himself. And Magellan was the first to navigate the globe circumnavigate the globe, but only his team. Magellan never made it back home again. He was under the sponsorship of King Charles I of Spain. And this man, Sebastian Elcano, in 1522, finished the voyage of the 20. Two that started it out. Magellan was killed in 1521 in the Philippines by an uprising of the natives 
under the leadership of Lapu Lapu. But that's a story for another day. But the Filipinos were dead set against what the Spanish were doing to them in their, in their treatment. From 1854 to 1898, there was a Spanish occupation, and that's depicted on this set of stamps from the Philippines. Probably one of the nicest sets of stamps that I, in my opinion, and uh, they picture Magellan landing on the left, and a city scene on the right, and an airplane. I don't think that airplane was in vogue at the time. But the center piece of this is the first issue of Filipino stamp. They do a lot of stamp on stamps. One of these times, I'm gonna to put together a PowerPoint of just the Philippines stamp on stamp. There's quite a few of them. But in 1898, the Spanish were booted out in the Spanish-American War. And that's a topic for yet another PowerPoint. But this is, again, one of my favorite stamps showing the Battle of Manila. Beautiful uh, engraving, nice subject matter. But Spain ceded the Philippine Islands to the United States after they lost the war and the Philippines remained under U.S. administration until November 15th of 1935 when they were given their independence subject to a transition period. Now 1898 to 1935, that's a pretty long transition period, isn't it? And the U.S. never got out until the 80s and 90s they still had naval bases there and an air base there. Um, I wanted to say something about this. I forgot what it was. Oh, so we've had a Spanish occupation. So we had Spanish stamps. We had American occupation. So we had Amer American stamps that were overprinted. And then we had Japanese stamps when Japan took over the Philippines on December 8, 1941. Do you remember why that's so? Not December 7th, which is my birthday. We crossed the international date line. And when it was seventh year, it was actually eight there. And Japan issued the first set of semi-postal stamps to promote the produce and conservation of food. Now I think I have a big one of this stamp, the 16 center. This one is rather costly compared to the others. It depicts all three stamps, the purple one, the green one, and the orange one were to promote and to produce and preserve food. They have a pastoral scene. They have a farm and a farmer in the front, a lady, and back in the back, they have a cannery. That looks like it was real nice and peaceful in the Philippines. Under the Japanese, it was not. It was pretty horrendous. It's hard to tell from that stamp what it was like. The second set of stamps were funded by a semi-postal surtax for a flood. Again, this was during a Japanese occupation. The Japanese printed their own stamps for the Philippines with Japanese inscriptions and they had the boat that you see on the left, the straw hut that you see in the right, Mount Mayon that you see on, um, on the right, the Nipah hut in the center. 
the Baja is overprinted. And you can see that for a stamp that was 12 cents on the left, there was a 21 cent surcharge and a 36 cent surcharge and a 40 cent surcharge. That was all to go towards the relief of flooding, which takes place quite frequently in a tropical island. 1943, which is the, the date on these semi posts, this surtax was put on to help these people. And then we became a republic in the Philippines. We became independent of the United States, but we were still dependent. And they came up with the first Philippine semi postal stamps. A set of three, they don't all fit together in my mind because we have three librarians on the left. We have a document, the Doctrine of Christianity in the center, and the Nolia Tanger cover page, which was part of Rizal's writings for the revolution. But this surtax that you see, a two cent, a four cent, and a seven cent surtax, was for the restoration of war damaged public library. So they valued the libraries as a resource for education. And then by 1950, we come up with some stamps that had a surtax for war widows, that's the one on the left, and or orphans or children. And then the, the one on the right, the purple stamp, for disabled veterans of, of the war. This one just stands out to me as a very beautiful set of stamps and it doesn't fit with everything. But this is a Philippine stamp with a very small surcharge to encourage planting and care of fruit trees. That just doesn't somehow fit my picture. And then sometimes what they did, the Philippines is noted for overprinting its stamps, revaluing them. And in this case, they took away the value of the two surcharge stamps by just making them a regular value for postage. The next set of stamps honor Manuel Quezon, Quezon Institute in the background, and Kazan himself in the uh, oval. Right. And this is interesting. These stamps were obligatory on all mail from August 19th of 1958 through September. Six weeks. They were the only stamps that you could use to mail post -it, mail letters. And the surtax on all the semi postals from here on, including this one was for the purpose of supporting the Philippine Tuberculosis Society. Unless otherwise stated, those resolve stamps that I started, started with, for one, I'll show you that in a minute. And then they surcharged the surcharge by changing it just a little bit as far as the value of the stamps was concerned. Then out of the blue in 1959, comes the 10th World Scaling Jamboree in the Philippines. It was a world jamboree, and they came up with a whole slew of different variations of these five stamps that you see under right in the center. They came up with a souvenir sheet below. They came up with a Tetebesh pair, a head-to-head, -head or head to tail, I'm sorry, in the upper left. And then they overprinted the head to tails. And they even printed them on yellow paper instead of white paper up in the upper right hand corner. It's an interesting set. It's very vibrant in real life. The souvenir sheet sells for two bucks, maybe three. 
but try to get all the individual stamps, that's a little tougher. Now we get on to the set of from 59 to 65, that's six years. They loved the semi-postal stamps. They all had the tuberculosis cross on them, except for one pair. And they had pictures of the sanitariums, the pavilions, they called them. There are three different ones. They're different sets. I'll not go through them all. Over in the right hand, I'm sorry, the left hand side, the B21 and B22 are the Jose Rizal stamps. And they were, well, I'll show you that in just a second. Tuberculosis is still prevalent in the world today. I'm not sure, I'm not a doctor, but as I was reading about tuberculosis, it's something that infects the lungs. They know it's a myomice, it's a bacterium, and it gives you a chronic cough and blood-containing mucus, and it's very contagious, and it almost sounds like COVID. But heaven forbid that we would have a tuberculosis outbreak. That's the Resolve set to raise funds for the Resolve Foundation. I don't know what that did. I didn't investigate that. But the Tuberculosis Society got regular issue stamps converted into semi-postals, again designed to raise funds for the Tuberculosis Society. The neatest set, I think, are the next two. They have some of the tropical birds of the Philippines that are really kind of unique looking. The stork-billed kingfisher, the rufous hornbill, that second one from the left, and the monkey-eating eagle. He looks pretty ferocious. I never saw any of these when I was in the Philippines, but I wasn't a bird back then. The second set, again, all these had a five cent surcharge on them. And then the, the, basically the last Filipino cause to, to fund, a, fund a tuberculosis society was in honor of Donna Julia Bidortigas. And so she got a full set of four stamps with different values, one, five, 30, and 70, plus the five centavo. She was the president of the Tuberculous Society for 37 years. That's pretty amazing. And that's just a larger version of the stamp to show you some of the detail the stamp isn't quite that big in real life. TB is still a problem in the Philippines to this day. The fact sheets that I found online show that the Philippines ranks ninth in the list of 22 high tuberculosis burden countries, which together contribute 80% of the global TB, TB burden. The next last set of stamps were fruits of the Philippines. I think I got to eat most of those. My wife and I were dorm parents to 20 boys. I told you that at the beginning. And we had to go to market. Market was an open market. And I had to get a suki, a, bo a boy who would get me the best price for food that I was buying for the dormitories. And every time there was a new fruit in season, he had samples for me to eat or to taste, hoping that I would buy them. Well, they even surcharged some of the 
fruit stamps. Again, all this was for the tuberculosis society. This is a hard to find cover. First day, it's got lanzonis, oranges, serhunias, and pineapple on one stamp, different Philippine fruit on each of the other stamps. And it's all pretty good. There were a few I didn't care for. The last set of stamps is in honor of Dr. Basilio Valdez. He served as the vice president of the Tuberculosis Society until 1974 when he passed away. This was the final surtax. And then, which the Philippines did a lot of right around the 70s and early 80s. They produced a set of stamps in perforate. So you had the perforate stamps and the imperforate stamps. And then you get perforate or imperforate pairs. And you have vertical pairs and horizontal pairs. A uh, lot of varieties, all designed to please the stamp collector and to make money for the government. There are 51 Scott numbers for 70 postal stamps from the Philippines. So it's a manageable area to collect. Plus there's one souvenir sheet. Plus there are three numbers for that semi-postal souvenir sheet. And there are six semi-postal stamps issued under Japanese occupation. So it's a very manageable collection. I went online. I could buy the whole set mint, unhinged, for around ten dollars, or at least starting bid at that. Well, that's enough. Do you have any comments or questions or things you'd like to ask me? Questions for George? It's quiet. Yeah, there, there's some, some, some very beautiful stamps. So once they started issuing uh, the sets for TB, it stayed that way pretty much till the end, except for, well, actually it honored, you know, the president and the vice president as well. Questions, anybody? Yes, yeah, anybody? Uh, if I may raise a few questions and also some comments. I greatly enjoyed the presentation. Um, it, the way it was linked with history, um, I think really brings life to stamps. Um, but the use of um, uh, semi-postals being mandatory during that short period of time, um, I've never heard of that being done. And I'm wondering whether it's done anywhere else in, in the world. And also, um, it was not mandatory in the US. And I have a feeling the semi-postals didn't sell too well other than to collectors. They were not a big selling item. Um, any comments from fellow members about that? I was, I was, I was surprised to find that six week period where it was mandatory. I think yeah. you'll, you'll find the same thing in Turkey. Turkey has a lot of semi-postals and they had mm. mandatory sections of three or four weeks a year when they demanded that you have uh, semi-postals used. Um, That's interesting because I think in the U.S., uh, I, I don't think they're used much for postage. It's mainly we collectors that bought them. I wonder yeah. whether they would uh, have been more value if they were made mandatory? Well, they made a lot of money, America, particularly with breast cancer. I know they made a lot of money for that research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Al, uh, this is Mike. Switzerland has two issues a year and has for many decades. Um, one is Pro Patria, which is for the country. And the other is Pro Juventuto, which is for the youth. 
And they are beautiful sets. Back in the 30s or 50s and 60s, I mean, they, they would have flowers and butterflies and all kinds of um, issues. But that was twice a year, and I think they still continue that. Mandatory? Um, well, they're issued every year. I mean, it's part of the Swiss issues each mm -hmm. year. I, I guess the people there just really jump on that. They're, they're, they support it. So mm -hmm. they've continued it for decades. At our last meeting, I asked you how many semi-postals the United States has. So you may have a number. Six. Six? There's actually seven. <laughs> but one of them's the same. Let me show you. I'm going to go through this quickly. Can you all see that? Yeah. George, you're getting a split screen. Yeah. Let me try it again. Sound. That should be better. That looks better. So I have to do one more thing. Bear with me. The first US semi postal stamp was in nineteen ninety eight. It was the breast cancer stamp that Ron was talking about. 
It initially sold for 40 cents and paid the then current rate of 32 cents plus eight cents to breast cancer research. Well, so you see on the left hand side, the 32 cents plus eight cents, it cost you 40 cents to buy that one stamp. And it was dated 1998. As we go on, the price went up of stamps of the postage. So if it still charged you 40 cents, you only paid seven cents extra. And then in the next year, when it went to 34 cents, you still only made six cents extra. And then they raised the price to 45 cents. Then they raised the price to stayed at 45 cents. Then they raised it to 55 cents. So all along up to 2007, that 98 breast cancer stamp far exceeded a two year limit that the government had set for semi-postals. The second semi-postal, the B2, this came out in 2002, and the first class rate was very confusing then. It changed in mid-course, just shortly after the stamp was issued. The third stamp in 2003 was 39 cents and it raised money to do a lot of good things for the shelters for women, individual and group counseling, legal assistance, courts and social services, etc. But it was an ugly stamp, in my opinion. Then the saving, the fourth stamp was this first class stamp with a plus on it, not telling you any values. It started at 49 cents plus 11. The fifth stamp, Ron, was the same breast cancer stamp, except it had the date 214 on it. Otherwise, and it a slight color change. Then the Alzheimer's stamp came out as number six. And then the healing post-traumatic stress syndrome came out as number seven. Now, the breast cancer research stamp you can still buy in the post office, in some post office. Breast cancer research is going to continue for a number of years, it's raised $95 million. That's pretty amazing. That's a lot of stamps to sell to make that much money. Save the Vanishing Species is still available and it's raised $7.2 million. That sounds like a still a pretty big figure to me. The Alzheimer's stamp which has only been out for two years, but then was withdrawn, then reissued again without changing it. And the healing post-traumatic stress syndrome, $1.7 million. That's a lot of money raised for charity from semi-postal stamps. There are the seven of them, Ron. You see the breast cancer stamp twice. One of them is different though than the other. And the, the lettering, the date, and some of the some of the color. That was a very controversial stamp when it first came out. I 
I was trying to find how many countries produce semi-postal stamps. And I came up with down in the right hand corner from this list that I found online of about 389. That number may, may of stamp producing countries. I don't know how many of them were semi postal stamps, like from the Philippines. This challenged me tonight. My Parkinson's sometimes reacts to tension. I'm doing a presentation to a group, even though you, I can see you all face to face and eyeball to eyeball, um, you're not sitting in front of me as a live audience, although you are all alive. But I appreciate your patience and putting up with my little bit of idiosyncrasy. Well, thank you very much, George, very much.